Veterans Day. World War I, known at the time as the Great War, officially ended when the Treaty of Versailles was signed on June 28, 1919. However, fighting between the Allied nations and Germany had actually ceased seven months earlier when an armistice, or a temporary end to hostilities, went into effect on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. For that reason, November 11, 1918 is regarded as the end of World War I. When President Dwight Eisenhower published a proclamation in the Federal Registry instructing citizens to recognize Veterans Day on November 11th, he wrote, On that day, let us solemnly remember the sacrifices of all those who fought so valiantly on the seas, in the air, and on foreign shores to preserve our heritage of freedom, and let us reconsecrate ourselves to the task of promoting and enduring peace so that their efforts shall not have been in vain. While Memorial Day is a time to remember those who gave their lives for our country, Veterans Day honors all of those who have served the country in war or peace, dead or alive, although it is largely intended to thank America's 18 million living veterans for their sacrifice. Hello, my name is Ryan Barilla. I'm a junior here at Colleyville, and I'm interviewing my dad here for you guys today for the Veterans Day program. So I'm going to start just with some basic questions, just so we can all get to know you. So what branch of service were you in and for how many years? Uh, yeah, I was in the Air Force and I was in the uh, United States Air Force for 20 years. And what was your rank in the Air Force? Um, so when I retired from the Air Force after 20 years, I retired as a lieutenant colonel. So where did you serve throughout this time? Lots of places, but where were some notable places? Sure, uh, yeah, and there were a lot of places. Uh, when you're in the military, you do move around quite a bit. Um, so I uh, was stationed everywhere from uh, Texas to Idaho to Florida to California to um, Nevada to Ohio. Um, and those were probably the major states I was um, stationed in. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of other trips uh, all over the country and all over the world. So then what was your job over the course of these 20 years? What sort of things did you do? Yeah, sure. So I was a pilot uh, for the Air Force. Uh, and specifically, I was a uh, fighter pilot. Um, and so I flew F-15s and I flew F-117s, at least at the beginning of my career. Uh, and then really after that, I was a test pilot. Uh, and so the majority of my time in the Air Force was as a test pilot. Uh, so as a test pilot, then I would test fly uh, a whole bunch of new types of airplanes, new configurations of old airplanes uh, and everything in between. Sometimes trying out some new, uh, some new software, sometimes trying out um, some new uh, weapons, um, so anything that needed to be tested on an airplane, uh, I would do that. And so I did some testing on F-15Cs and F-15Es. I did testing on F-16s um, and on F-22s. Um, and I also taught uh, as an instructor pilot uh, at the Air Force's test pilot school. Excellent. So, so kind of tell us about the beginning. What got you into serving? Why did you want to serve or decide yeah. to serve? Yeah, sure. Well, so, um, so my dad was in the Air Force and my dad also did 20 years as a pilot uh, in the Air Force. So that was kind of during, um, you know, the, the end of Vietnam and then really in the heart of the Cold War. Um, and then his dad, right? So my grandfather, served in World War II, uh, and he was a, he was a, a gunner on a B-24, which was a type of, um, of a four-engine bomber. Uh, and so he was, uh, he was in World War II over in England and flew a lot of missions there. So, so because of that history with my grandfather and really because of the history of my dad, uh, again, who uh, flew B-52s, uh, and he flew a bunch of other airplanes, too, in the Air Force, 
uh, I grew up in that world, right? I grew up um, moving around to different Air Force bases, um, seeing airplanes, um, going to air shows. Um, and that really got me interested in the Air Force and it got me interested in airplanes. Uh, and so that's probably um, one of the big things that then uh, pushed me into, um, into applying to get into the Air Force. Excellent. So we kind of got into it earlier, but can you kind of just give a brief timeline of your years? Um, yeah, so uh, I uh, graduated from high school in 1990, and then I went to the Air Force Academy. So the Air Force Academy is a four-year college uh, where you earn a degree, but then at the end of your four years of going to college and earning a degree, then you join the Air Force. So I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1994, uh, and then I spent from 1994 through 2014. Those were my 20 years uh, in the Air Force. So again, the first couple years, right? So from like 1994 to 1996, that's kind of you know some initial training. So going to pilot training, learning how to fly an airplane, and then learning how to fly, say, certain types of airplanes. Um, and then that's after that is when I did an assignment flying F-15s and I was stationed in Idaho. And then I did an assignment flying F-117s and that was when I was stationed in New Mexico. Uh, and then after that in 2001 um, is when I went to test pilot school and test pilot school is a one year school where they teach you how to be a test pilot and that's out in California. Uh, and so I was actually at that school during 9-11 uh, and I can remember very vividly um, being in the school during class um, with a TV on uh, watching um, the events of 9-11 happening. Uh, so after that, and then uh, again, I spent the rest of the time as a test pilot. So um, I spent about three years in Florida doing uh, some flight testing. Uh, I, in the F-15, I went back to California as an instructor at the test pilot school for about a year and a half. Um, I did some other, you know, kind of odds and ends uh, jobs. Here and there, you know, um, this, again, you do a lot of moving around. So I, uh, you know, I spent about a year in um, uh, Ohio getting a master's degree. Um, I went out to La, uh, to Nevada uh, to fly out there for a couple years. Uh, came back to Ohio for about a year. Uh, went out to California to do about, um, you know, uh, a year flying the F twenty two, and then uh, went back to uh, Nevada flying uh, the F sixteen. Uh, and that's when I retired in 2014. So you kind of you kind of touched on 9/11, but can you can you describe in more depth how that impacted the Air Force in general, but also your your pathway specifically? Yeah. Uh, so uh, interestingly, it, it didn't have as big of an impact on me. Number one, I was already in the Air Force, so you'll talk to uh, or you'll you know sometime you may hear from a lot of people who because of 9/11 join the military. Uh, of course, I was already in the military at that time. Um, on top of that, Desert Storm had happened back in about 1991, and there were still a lot of things going on there. So I had deployed um, before 9-11 out to Saudi Arabia. I had deployed out to Bahrain. Those are two countries there in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and so I'd already spent a lot of time in the Middle East, even before 9-11 happened. Obviously, after 9-11, that was a huge impact, not just to the Air Force, but to the military in general. So there are a lot more, um, you know, a lot, a lot more activity um, taking place in the Middle East um, between uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and then eventually after that, you know, in, uh, in Syria. So um, a, a lot of. A lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money spent um, in the Middle East uh, as a result of 9-11. Again, after 9-11, I spent almost all that time as a test pilot. So I was testing a lot of the new technologies that would go over to the Middle East. Um, but of course, I had a lot of friends and a lot of colleagues who then, after 9-11, spent a lot of time uh, deployed to the Middle East. And so that was probably the biggest impact I saw was that was just a humongous focus of the Air Force uh, really for a, a long time. And, and quite honestly, to this day, uh, still a pretty big focus. So, so over these 20 years, do you have any standout notable uh, experiences, instances, things, things of that sort? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of them. Um, you know, and it's one of those things where it's it, it's always fun to get together with uh, old Air Force friends because one of us will tell a story and that kind of spurs on the next person to tell a story and that gets somebody else to tell a story. Uh, and then you start bringing up all these stories that you kind of had forgotten about. Um, but yeah, there, there's a ton of them and I'm sure I'm going to forget uh, a lot of the good ones. But, you know, just right here, just sitting here, you know, things that kind of stand out to me. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, uh, de deploying to other countries was always just very standout, right? Because it's just very different and very unique. You know, the first time I deployed, it was from, this would have been in 1997. Um, and I flew an F-15 from um, Idaho to Saudi Arabia, right? And so if you look at a globe, that's a pretty long way. We actually broke it into two trips. Uh, so uh, half of it, we would we went to uh, we landed at an island uh, called the Azores, which is about a thousand miles west of Portugal in the Atlantic Ocean, and we spent a night there um, and then took off again. And so both of those were about nine and a half hour flights. So if you can imagine sitting uh, sitting strapped to a seat uh, and you can't move, right? You can't get up, you can't walk around. So it's like it's like being buckled into a car seat um, for about nine and a half hours. And that was the flying part, probably add another two hours because you would get ready on the ground and all that. And so you're sitting in this seat strapped in for probably about 12 hours. And we did that two days in a row. Um, and so think about how do you eat, right? How do you drink? How do you um, go to the bathroom? How do you kind of keep yourself entertained? Um, but um, but yeah, that was, so that was quite an experience. And so again, that was two nine and a half hour flights kind of back to back to get from Idaho all the way to uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, and so again, you know, just, you know, that's kind of stand out, right. Being in Saudi Arabia, kind of a completely different country than you've ever you know thought about or been to and just the experiences there, um, you know, kind of just the, the, the climate, right. The culture, um, you know, the weather, uh, of course, you know, the mission, cause you're doing a lot of flying while you're out there. Um, and it was pretty dangerous too, right? Because, um, you know, you, you're always, you're in combat. So you're always worried about what's going to happen. And uh, you want to make sure that, you know, you're doing everything you can to be safe. Uh, so obviously things like that stand out and um, you make a lot of really, really close friends. Uh, and to this day, people that I uh, went to Saudi Arabia with in that summer of 1997, um, I am still super close to a whole bunch of them. Uh, to this day that we still uh, talk, still text, still meet up and, uh, and visit. Uh, so certainly that's a big standout thing. Uh, I also got to go to Iceland, uh, spent some time in Iceland. Uh, and so again, that was a really interesting time there, getting to fly around the, that island, uh, getting to fly around the, uh, the ocean out there. Um, and so again, just a really unique part of the world to, uh, to see and to, an ex and to experience. Uh, and again, that just stands out just how beautiful and how gorgeous that land was out there. Um, it's just like nothing, uh, nothing I'd ever seen before. You know, so those are some standout um, things as far as uh, like locations that uh, that I went. Uh, and then obviously there's a lot of other neat standout things, right? Um, you know, between some really fun missions that you get to do, um, just, you know, sometimes just the act of flying itself. Uh, was pretty amazing, right? If it was uh, kind of a, a really early morning and you know it's it's foggy outside, and then you take off uh, with this big deafening roar of the jet engines, uh, and uh, you you get to retract the gear, um, and then you just kind of pull the nose of the airplane up, and you burst through the clouds, and the next thing you know, uh, when you get on top of the clouds, it is sunny and gorgeous and beautiful. Uh, and just things like that just really stand out in your mind of uh, some pretty unique experiences that you don't necessarily get to just do uh, on a daily basis. Right. Graduation up to now, even what experiences and and. Um, hold on, I'm going to pause and I'm going to restart that question. <laughs> so kind of as a conclusion. From from your time from 1994 even up to now, using that, what are two things you would tell yourself at at my age, at our age, at high school age? Um, 
Wow. So, um, so what would I tell you? And I guess maybe another way to think of it is what would I tell myself, right? If I were still, uh, if I were back in high school, right? And so and I can, I can place myself right back in high school. I went to high school um, uh, just outside of San Antonio, uh, Texas, uh, at uh, Converse Judson High School. Um, and I was, again, I was a class of 1990. Uh, so again, I can remember being a junior. I can remember being a senior um, and thinking about, wow, what's next? So probably the big thing, right, if I were to go back and tell myself, uh, uh, you know, what to think about is, is um, man, you know, work hard, right, and, um, but, but have a good time. Enjoy, enjoy the, the um, you know, enjoy life, right? Enjoy your, um, your, your path through life, right? Sometimes the path is going to be straight and you're going to know what you want to do and you're going to follow it and grab onto it. Uh, and you're going to go in a certain direction. Uh, and sometimes the path is going to be unfamiliar. Uh, sometimes the path is not going to be what you think it is. You might think that you're destined for one thing uh, and something happens and something pops up. And the next thing you know, you're doing something completely different. Um, that's all right. You know, uh, embrace those changes. Embrace that that uh, kind of uh, unknown piece of life. Um, and if you can do that, well, then, you know, just remember life's a gift and enjoy it. Uh, and, you know, obviously you want to work hard, you want to set goals and you want to you know, chart out a path. Um, but if that doesn't work out for you, that's OK. You know, just uh, look for uh, different directions to go, different things that you can do. Um, and I'll give you one example. Right. I, I thought I always wanted to be an astronaut. Right. Uh, and so I studied up on being an astronaut uh, and I learned about all the different things you had to do. And I actually got to even um, apply to be an astronaut. And then I was actually even selected to go out to um, the uh, to to Houston, right, to the space center, uh, to have an interview. And I spent a week out there interviewing to be an astronaut. Um, and at the end of it all, I was not selected to be an astronaut. But instead of being upset about it, right, and instead of of, of thinking of myself as having not reached a goal. Well, no, in fact, uh, that actually opened up a lot of other avenues and a lot of other doors that I maybe hadn't thought about before. Uh, and so when I look at my life now and what I've been able to do and where I am, um, I'm really happy. And in fact, um, there's a part of me that's kind of thankful that I did not get picked up to be an astronaut uh, because otherwise a lot of the things that happened in my life would not have happened. So that'd be one big thing um, is, yeah, just embrace life to include all the challenges and to include all of the, the different unique circumstances you might find yourself in, because it's, it's not always just a straightforward path. You know, sometimes things are going to go not the way you expect them to go. And, you know, if you can, um, if you can flex and if you can just, uh, you know, uh, just pick yourself up and, and go a new direction, um, you know, that's, that's a great quality to have. And it's going to serve you not just, as a high school student, uh, but it's going to serve you throughout your life. So that would be one big thing I'd say. And probably the other big thing, right, if you're looking for the second big thing would be, um, you know, um, look for good friends, right? Um, and uh, recognize in high school, you know, you make a lot of friends because you're around people all the time, you know. And um, I think one thing that older people will always tell you is it's, it's tougher as you get older to make friends. Uh, so when you find friends, Cherish those friends, right? Value those friends. Make an effort to stay in touch uh, with those friends, uh, because those are the people that uh, are gonna are gonna uh, stay with you and help you out whenever needed. Um, just uh, two nights ago, um, I uh, had about a, a hour long phone call with the um, person that I was a roommate with my freshman year at the Air Force Academy. So if you think about that, right, that was back in like 1990, really, is when it was. It was the, the fall of 1990. So I guess that is um, exactly 30 years ago. I was rooming with this guy. Um, you know, we were both about 18, right? Um, and now here we are, and um, we just pick up the phone, and we just talk like nothing's changed, you know? Um, you know, we talk about family. We talk about work. We talk about hobbies. We talk about just interests, talk about how we're doing. Um, it's important to 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 keep those close friends and nurture those um, those friendships because um, they don't just they're not going to take care of themselves 
without uh, action. You need to really make sure that you're reaching out, right? Uh, and keeping in touch with people and keeping those relationships uh, going, you know? And if you feel like, hey, this person hasn't called me in a while, well, guess what? You probably haven't called them in a while. So, you know, shoot them a text, give them a call, uh, go meet up with them if they're in the local area. But, um, you know, if you can really build on those strong friendships with some of these people that you meet, and again, you, you're gonna meet people, uh, you know, uh, you know, as you go through your life and some people that you thought were super close friends in high school, you're never going to talk to again. And some people that you meet in 20 years might be the closest friend of your life, you know? So, so seek them out, uh, identify them, uh, nurture, uh, those friendships, uh, because, uh, those relationships, uh, really when it's all said and done, uh, are probably what's going to bring you the most joy in your life. Wonderful. Well, thank you for your words and, and your wisdom and for, for just taking the time to share with us your experiences. Um, absolutely. Thank you for uh, letting me be a part of your program. Um, and I hope that uh, all of you uh, have a, a, a wonderful uh, rest of your semester. Uh, I realize things are really just uh, just crazy and, and out of the ordinary right now uh, with COVID. Um, but again, you know, whether you want to believe it or not, it's going to be a, uh, this is going to be something you're always going to remember, right? And so in the midst of all of the craziness, don't forget to take a step back, take a breath, uh, and then just go, you know what? You know, this is life. Uh, sometimes life throws you curveballs. Um, you know, make the best of it and roll with it. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for letting me be a part of it. Um, and thank you for uh, for uh, everything that you guys are doing as well.